Well, good evening, everybody. Very good, very good. Uh, I'm Wayne Kramer, I'm president of the board of directors of the LBJ Museum of San Marcos. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our 15th anniversary gala. Uh, this night's been a long time coming. Well, 15 years to be exact. Uh, but the gala was originally scheduled for September. Uh, and we decided to postpone that to tonight. However, even that decision was difficult. Uh, on this evening, I'm sort of reminded of the great philosopher Casey Stengel, <laughs> baseball manager with the Yankees and the Mets, uh, who remarked one time that ability is the art of getting credit for all the home runs somebody else hits. <laughs> Our ability to have this event tonight uh, and and, uh, and all they're putting together uh, is a success due to the home run hitting of a couple of people. Debbie Butler, our museum manager. Yeah. And assistant manager, Elisa Pena. From concept to completion, they've been creative, resourceful, and tenacious. And so I give them our thanks. Debbie, always the entrepreneur, wanted me to remind you that the centerpieces on the table are available for 20 bucks. There you go. Uh, tonight also would just not be possible without you, our attendees. Your generous support has been, a crit has been critical to this event and to the livelihood of the museum. We're very, very, very grateful. We hope that you choose to continue to support us in our mission. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge our, some of our sponsors. Our presidential sponsor, HEB, vice presidential sponsor, Lucy Baines Johnson, senatorial sponsor, Jane Houston, and congressional sponsors, Eleanor Crook, Mike and Nora Miller, and Texas State University. One way you can continue to support us tonight is bidding on the silent auction items. Uh, and also the 20 bucks for the Taste of Texas, our Taste of Dining Room. It's good, very good, very good. It's a good bargain. Uh, we have some great items up for auction. We hope you will find something that you just can't live without or don't want anybody to live with. Uh, my association with the museum has been a journey of connectivity. Uh, as the director of the LBJ Debate Society of Texas State, I've learned how much LBJ's experience as a debater and a high school debate coach has shaped his thinking and helped to formulate a basis for his future in politics. So the museum's highlighting of LBJ's college years resonated with me in a unique way and sort of brought me full circle. I've always thought that museums are wonderful guardians of time that permit us to treasure, respect, and remember the things that are important to our soul. And I believe that we create a space that honors Lyndon in that way. Interestingly, interestingly enough, Today marks the 49th anniversary of his death. He was only 65 when he died. I just never always think that. Uh, it also makes us mindful of the issues that were important to LBJ's soul that are still being debated today. Civil rights, voting rights, other components of a great society are now being tested and challenged. And we should stand as guardians on their behalf. I would also like to acknowledge several of our elected officials who are here tonight who have stood as guardians on our behalf. State Representative Aaron Zwina, Hayes County Judge Ruben Becerra, I'll go through them all over the back. San Marcos Mayor Jane Houston and San Marcos Council Member Mark Gleason. We also have representatives from some of the other museums in town, from the Calaboots and Centro. And we thank you for joining and attending the event. Now for our speaker. For the past seven years, W.F. Strong has been the Texas History and Cultural Culture Commentator for the Texas Standard Radio Network on NPR. He has published two books on Texas, Stories from Texas, some of them are true, and a sequel, <laughs> Stories from Texas, Volume 2. They're available at the desk. Um, the seed for Stories from Texas was planted decades ago when he was growing up in Falfurious, Texas, in a book-filled home with a mother librarian and a father, an educator, passionate about Texas history, and a teller of Texas tall tales. Dr. Strong holds a degree in communication literature from Abilene Christian, 
and a communication oral literature degree from the University of North Texas. His PhD in communication and rhetoric is from the University of Arizona. I first met Bill when we were both teaching at Texas A&M. And I remember that he did an incredible Mark Twain. Now, Mark Twain was the focus of his doctoral dissertation at Arizona. Uh, he's been talking about LBJ tonight. If we ever get him back, Mark Twain. Uh, Dr. Strong is a Fulbright Scholar and Professor of Communication and Culture at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Bill grew up working on farms and ranches in South Texas and so has a, has a long connection with Texas, with Texas soil, as did his ancestors. Two of his distant relatives signed the Texas Declaration of Independence. This familial history has nurtured his love for the vibrancy of Texas culture, both historical and modern. I'm very, very pleased to present Dr. W. F. Strong. Well, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. It's always nice to get out from behind the, the mic at the radio studio and see real people. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that never happens to me when I get out in public is nobody ever comes up to me and says, you know, I, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reminiscing here um, <clears throat> with Wayne and Mark Busby. Uh, we were together at A&M back in the early 80s. We were teaching there together. They were a bit ahead of me, but I was uh, a young whippersnapper, just uh, my first job, really. And, uh, but I want you guys to rest easy. My motto is, what happened in the 80s stays in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Well, since you mentioned Mark Twain, I might as well go ahead and tell you my favorite Twain story. We'll work that in, and then we'll get on to Linda, who was also a great storyteller, as you know. So, um, here's one of Mark Twain's favorite stories. It's kind of a bandwidth story, so it's pretty cool on you to hear. He said that, he said, you know, it was about uh, a few months ago that I came down with a bad case of the influenza. And I went to the doctor, and the doctor said to me, look here. I can cure you in a week. You must give up all smoking, all drinking, all excessive eating, all swearing. And by the end of the week, you'll be better. So I gave up smoking and drinking and swearing and excessive eating. And by the end of the week, I was on my feet again. I was better. So I gave thanks to God, and I took to these delicacies again. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't long after that that an elderly lady friend of mine came down with the very same thing. And I went to her and I said, look here, I'm cure you in a week. You must give up all smoking, all drinking, all swearing, all excessive eating. By the end of the week, you'll be on your feet. Well, she said she couldn't give up smoking and drinking and swearing because she had never done any of those things. <laughs> so there it was, you see. She had neglected her habits. <laughs> she was just a sinking ship, so great, so old boy. One or two of them bad habits might have saved that. <laughs> There's the Twain story. <laughs> okay, good night. <laughs> well, as Wayne pointed out, uh, this is, by accident, the 49th anniversary of Lyndon Johnson's passing. And this is an interesting day because we can you know, look back at all that he had accomplished in his times and I particularly looked at a lot of the things that people reminisced or said about him eulogistically uh, 49 years ago today. He seemed to expect it really in a way because he always said, you know, the Johnson men don't live so long. And he died at uh, 65. And there's another date that's sticking out for me right now is uh, at 12.05 tonight, I'll be 67. Uh, mm -hmm. Birthday is tomorrow. Yeah. But it's hard for me to realize that I've lived longer than he did. Yeah. I, I, to quote Twain again, I recognize it, but I don't realize it. It's a hard thing to get through your head. How did I get so old? How did that happen? <laughs> Time flies and it flies ever faster, unfortunately. It moves along. But you know, uh, I think of my mother. My mother lived to be 102, and so that's good news for me. And uh, she always said that if you, you know, people always ask her, because she lived to be 102, a vibrant 102. She quit mowing her lawn when she was 85. She was a very vibrant 102. 
Uh, so people always ask, what's, what's the secret? How do you live to be 100? She said, well, you live to be 99, and then you be damn careful. <laughs> <laughs> so I've lived longer than Lyndon did, but that's not surprising, really, because he had the Vietnam War to manage. I only had to manage to stay out of it. <laughs> and that was pretty easy, because I was a little bit too young, and I had a draft number, uh, had a draft number of 307. So for those of you old enough, you'll know that uh, there was no chance in hell that I was going to go to Nam. And then, you know, Lyndon, he used to say, as a very famous quote from him, when he would worry about the stress of the presidency, he would say, whenever I get to feel sorry for myself, I say, well, it could have been worse. I could have been a mayor. <laughs> That's a tough job. When Lyndon died, my father said to me, let me back up all of this, it's giving me feedback here. When, my father, uh, when Lyndon died, my father said to me, you remember meeting him, don't you? And I said, I remember you telling me. I remember it vaguely, because I was four years old. When I, met him. I met him on the tarmac of a little airport near Falcurius. Lyndon had flown in to go hunting with uh, Percy Hunter, perfect name for a guy who's a hunting guy, right? Percy Hunter. He managed the Mills Bennett Ranch. And he had flown in there. My father was superintendent of schools and Percy Hunter was on the school board. So he took me out there to meet him and other dignitaries. I don't know who all was there, maybe Connolly. And all I remember at four years old was watching my hand disappear into Lyndon's hand. <laughs> Where did he go? And I remember he was loud. I was four years old and he was a loud, booming voice. And so it you know, had a great impact on my memory, of course. He, I doubt he ever remembered meeting me, but uh, I always remember this big man. And what's interesting also is that uh, he was always a promoter of all things Texas, as you know. And it was about in 1966 when he was president. He uh, was talking to some reporters there in the White House, and he said, I'm going to go for a walk. If you want to come with me, come along. And so they came along with him. And as he exited the East Gate, there were some tourists there, and he started to talk to them. And it turned out they were from Fox Furious. And he said, do you know Percy Hunter? And they said, yeah. And they said, tell Percy hello. Tell him hello from LBJ. And then he turns to the reporters and he said, if you ever get down there in Falcurius, you try some of that sweet cream butter they got down there. It's the finest butter in the world. You've got to try it, you know. And so uh, this was an AP story, and it was printed in all the newspapers. And Percy Hunter, he carried that in his wallet for years. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson mentioned me at the White House. You know? <laughs> but it also was one of those things that Falcurius was a town of 5,000 people out in what the Hispanics call the Monte, you know, out in the boonies. And so it was nice to have someone like Lyndon put us on the map, you know, it was a very, very cool thing. And it was really the hunting there, still is. Uh, King Ranch owned half of the county that I grew up in, literally half of it. And then you had other big ranches like Mills Bennett, Monte Close, and Cage, et cetera. So it was a ranching community. And um, you know, I worked on those ranches because that was a, it's where you worked, you no know, other jobs. You built fences and uh, on the farms, harvest the watermelons and that sort of thing. So, uh, I have had a long connection to Lyndon accidentally over and over through my life, besides meeting him when I was very young, <clears throat> is that uh, my first uh, professorship outside of uh, being a, getting my doctorate was at Texas Southwoods College and uh, UT Brownsville. Well, it was, it was Pan Am at the time. But, that was our school. Uh, yeah. We went there, we know the name. You went there, yeah. <laughs> so that school, interestingly enough, that Texas Southwoods College, that campus where I still am today, by the way, it is on the border, uh, the, the Rio Grande is on the southern border of that campus. And that campus exists because of LBJ. Because it was an army fort, you probably are at least vaguely familiar with the story. It was the, created during the Mexican-American War. It was originally Fort Texas, became Fort Brown, 
And uh, that's how Brownsville has its name, of course. And it was so uh, that junior college, Texas South Coast College, was created in 1926, the first junior college in Texas. And when the and it, it occupied the night school at, at the Brownsville High School for a long time. And in 1946, the fort was decommissioned. And they were going to give it to the city. But there was a guy on the board, those of you on the board, you know how important this is, networking, had known Lyndon here at Southwest Texas. And he called him up and he said, we really need that campus. We need that uh, fort for the college. And Lyndon said, okay, well, let me see what I can do. And then a week later, it's yours. And so I think of that all the time. I teach in this, this, this beautiful campus, subtropical, where the uh, architecture of the original fort is uh, carried on in the, uh, what they call the dialect of the architecture throughout all the buildings. Subtropical, you know, the wild green parrots flying through uh, the canopy of the trees. Very, 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 very nice. Now, when they had the border uh, fence coming through there, the border wall, they call it, we were worried because it was going to come right through the campus. That wall was going to bifurcate the campus. We said, my God, students are going to have to have a passport to go from biology to chemistry. <laughs> the border guards there, I'm going to chemistry now. <laughs> but we worked a deal. It's the only deal I've known to be worked. Uh, President uh, Julia Garcia, who's phenomenal this sort of thing, made a deal with them built a, instead of an 18-foot fence, they built an eight, uh, a 10-foot fence, and it's just a decorative. You wouldn't even know it's the border fence. It just, she planted bougainvilleas, and <laughs> <laughs> but it's there, it's, it's a fence. So anyway, Lyndon Johnson gave the land to the college that I, that's been my life on. Interesting, huh? Now, LBJ, as you know, was a great storyteller. I have been a storyteller all my life because I grew up farmers and ranchers, and they're just storytellers by nature, you know. And um, I started about 10 years ago telling Texas stories on the local NPR station down there in the valley, and then that got picked up by others, and then finally Texas Standard called and said, would you like to work for us? And um, they had, you know, 33 stations, so I said, yeah, okay, I would love to. And so I've been with them ever since. But Lyndon Johnson is responsible for that too, because uh, he essentially created public broadcasting. And so really, I wouldn't even be standing in front of you today <laughs> doing this. You would know me if it hadn't been for Lyndon creating public broadcasting that allowed me to walk into a little station in Brownsville, Texas and say, I'd like to tell a few stories on the air. <laughs> and if I did that to a commercial station, I'd say, get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but it allowed me a chance to try out this art form and nurture it and let it grow. And public broadcasting made that possible and Lyndon made public broadcasting possible. So Johnson was a storyteller like me, and uh, I thought I'd just share with you some of the stories that he, he told. Given that you're, you've had a long interest in him, you may know them already, but uh, pretend that you don't. <laughs> One of the stories that he loved, he always loved stories that you know, naturally uh, attacked government or, or uh, explained government in unique ways, but uh, he liked this story. He said, there was a boy who lived with his mom in Central Texas, very poor. His mom was very poor. The boy felt bad. So he wrote a letter to God. He said, God, please send my mother a hundred dollars because she really deserves it. And he just sent it to the post office and the postmaster there sent it on and went to the postmaster general of the United States in Washington. And he read it and touched his heart and he said, God, yeah, I'm going to do something. And he put 20 bucks in an envelope, put an airmail stamp on it, mailed it to the boy. And about two weeks later, he gets a letter back from the boy. He says, dear God, thank you so much for the $20. But next time you send money, don't send it through Washington. They took 80% of it. <laughs> So he loved those kinds of stories, you know, to illustrate government ex 
excess. Another one that I like of his was uh, he referred to he referred to Barry Goldwater and uh, to Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller. He referred to them as Barry and Rocky. He called them Barry and Rocky. And he was telling some people, he said, you know, I heard that Barry and Rocky, uh, in their bid for the GOP nomination, they quit going quite so often to California. They were going a lot, now they've backed off of that a good deal. And he said, I, I, think, uh, I think they found themselves in a problem that I once saw in Texas, where there was a young boy in a small town who wanted to run for sheriff against a sheriff that was not very popular. And so the young boy says to his friend, he said, I want to run for sheriff. Do you think I have a chance? And he said, well, I think it all depends on who meets the most people. And he said, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Whoever gets out and meets the most people. He said, yeah, because if you meet the most people, he'll win. And if he meets the most people, you'll win. He said, I think that's the position that Barry and Rocky found themselves in, you know. They won't need less exposure to win. <laughs> So he has had great stories to illustrate uh, political issues, political problems. Um, I was, the other day, I was talking to uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin. You know her, right? The great Pulitzer Prize winning uh, historian. And uh, actually Thursday night, I was talking to her. And uh, if you think I'm name dropping, you're damn right. <laughs> I'll tell you how it came about is I knew that I was going to do this and I knew she was very close to Lyndon Johnson and I knew that she um, really more than anybody else had written a definitive uh, biography. And Carl has a wonderful biography, very, very detailed and probably in a historical sense, in a historical academic sense, better than hers, but she worked with him. She knew him very, very well and better than anybody. So she wrote a beautiful book and a great biography. And since I was coming here, and I knew she always really loved him, I sent her a letter, and I just told her I was coming here and wanted to know if she could send her good wishes. And she called me. Well, her secretary called me first. She said, would you, would you be willing to take a call from Doris Kearns Goodwin? I said, well, I'm kind of busy right now. <laughs> and she called me tomorrow. <laughs> It was like 9 o'clock at night, I know she's on the East Coast, it was 10 o'clock her time, you know, she called me. She said, I'm so excited that uh, that museum is doing great work. She said, I wanted to talk to you and I wanted to send my good wishes to them and tell them that I admire and I'm proud of them for continuing to promote his legacy. And then, so, yes, applaud. said to me, she said, uh, make sure to take lots of pictures and send them to me because I want to see the event I want to, I want to experience it vicariously. But anyway, I talked to her for about 30 minutes and she told me a great deal about her years with Lyndon Johnson and why she admired him so much. And she was particularly um, happy, she said, I'm happy that his legacy is on the ascension. He said, uh, you know, that Vietnam errors are fading away and the great work he did for the great society, those things are living on beautifully. And she said, I just wish that he had lived to see it. She said he was so worried in his latter days about that negativity on his image. And he just, uh, she said, I just wish he had lived long enough to see the renaissance that is occurring for his image. And she said that she was working on an oral history of Cthulhu because she said that Lyndon, well, you know, her husband wrote the We Shall Overcome speech. And Lyndon, in the midst of his writing that speech, and Lyndon had told him the things he wanted to stress, but he called him up and said, oh, you got to put Cthulhu in there. Make sure you mention Cthulhu when you talk about the Great Society and my wish to help the impoverished children that came to me mostly when I was in Cthulhu and saw the poverty and the, the desperation and lack of hope those kids had. He said, uh, that's what I want to do is create a world of hope for kids like that uh, across the country, black, white, brown, doesn't matter. So 
she said that was a big deal to him, Catula, and she's doing some uh, oral histories to see the impact that he had on that community over time. And so she asked me if I could help her uh, gather some of these materials, and I said, well, I'm busy. <laughs> Now, she told me a story. She said, she said that she was down here helping with the memoirs. And she was on the ranch. And she said that uh, one day, Lyndon invited her on a picnic. He said, Doris, I want you to come with me on a picnic. She was, you know, 30 years old. I want you to go with me on a picnic. I want to talk to you. So they got in the Cadillac and they drove out onto the ranch and under a nice oak tree, spread out the blanket, checkered blanket, picnic blanket. Had the fried chicken in a basket and everything. She said she was worried because, you know, he had a reputation of being kind of flirty. <laughs> and she said, so I'm sitting there and he says, Doris, I brought you out here to tell you something. And she said, oh no, here it comes. And he said, you remind me of my mother. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I was most both relieved and offended. <laughs> but he, he uh, that was a great compliment, of course, because he loved his mother. His mother made him who he was. So, uh, and that's why he loved her, Doris, because she was structured and organized. And I was thinking that the other day, she's 79 years old, and she's doing an oral history of a tulip, you know. <laughs> she just keeps on going. Um, now, she said that he learned storytelling from his father and grandfather. He listened on the porch at night as they talked to older men. That was LBJ's unique power, his interpersonal rhetoric. He could read people and package his argument so that it was uniquely positioned just for them. And that was his talent. He wasn't an eloquent person. Uh, his humor wasn't like John Kennedy's who would say in a one-liner, I'm the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy to Paris. You know, he, he didn't... He didn't have the clever little one-liners. He was better not in the uh, I have a dream sort of speech. He was better at the uh, interpersonal charisma, you might say. That's, that was her point. He always did it with great stories, uniquely positioned for that person. And uh, I was thinking the other day when they were having trouble getting this uh, bill through the Senate on voting rights. And uh, I thought, man, if Lyndon were only around, you know, they would probably come to him and say, Lyndon, we can't get that through, we can't get that through the Senate, it's impossible. And he'd say, impossible? <laughs> Hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would have gotten on the phone and he would have used those block phones, the dollars, that was his favorite political weapon. He would have gotten on that phone and he would have had a deal by midnight. You know? He just had that unique charisma and power uh, of argument. And a lot of that he learned here at Southwest Texas when he went to school. Because, as uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin says in her book, that he started out working as a janitor at the school and worked his way up to where he got a job, you know, there at the president's office. And there he learned that he could uh, pull the levers of power because he could control access to the president. He, could control students and faculty. And not only that, he created a political base and he shifted the budgets to where he could control them. The, not, not the faculty budgets, but the student life budgets. He, he got control of them by creating a uh, machine, a political machine. But I just relied upon notoriety. I didn't build a machine. <laughs> you know, I didn't think like that when I was 20 years old. And man, he was born thinking this way, I suppose. And he carried that on to Washington where he built a similar machine. Now, the other thing that he did that was very helpful to me is uh, he created NASA. Now, he doesn't get enough credit. Kennedy had the pronouncement that we will go to the moon, but Lyndon got us there. The best place was Florida. And Lyndon said, no, Texas will be good. Let's move it over here. <laughs> so he put it in Texas. So how does that affect me? It affects me in only a couple of ways, because uh, I left academia, well, I left the classroom for about five years, and I was vice president for um, advancement at UT Brownsville. 
And it was my job to bring in money, bring in money for the university, through foundation stuff, and through federal grants. We happen to have a very powerful group of physics professors there, astrophysicists, who were mostly out of Latin America. They had created a kind of cabal of astrophysicists who were well known around the world. They liked it there because it was Spanish, everybody spoke Spanish, right? So they called them home. Well, these guys were completely funded by NASA. So for one thing, it made me look good as a guy who was raising money because they bring in 10 million at a time. They created the Center for Gravitational Wave Astronomy there in Brownsville. Who, who knew, right? But when uh, Elon Musk came down there, 15 miles to the east of us, he wanted to create, of course, Starbase. And it was helpful that he had this group of NASA astrophysicists right there in the backyard who could collaborate with uh, SpaceX. And if you haven't been out there, mind you ought to see it. It's just an incredible facility that has sprung out of that uh, delta. I mean, it would, there was nothing there for hundreds of years. Wow. You yeah, have this incredible uh, campus that they built out there. And uh, very impressive. But that wouldn't be there if uh, NASA weren't created and had that relationship and those money's flowing. Uh, I, I mean, it might be there anyway, but it helped. My point. It helped. So, those are some of the ways that uh, Lyndon has helped my life. Now, going on to his own perceptions of things, by the end of his life, he had a new achievement he was proudest of, and he believed would be his greatest legacy, and that was the founding of the LBJ School of Public Affairs, in tandem with dedicating his presidential library at the University of Texas. This was his effort at long-lasting legacy, because he believed that it's the institutions that carry the future. Institutions are the foundations. If you build those institutions, they will carry forth the message and the money and the human capital to make things happen for years and years to come. Uh, as, as a guy who worked in development, I loved uh, endowments. I loved people who would come and, and create a million dollar endowment because that money would work forever. It would work forever. In fact, let me do this little aside. There was a guy once. I got a call from a lawyer around Christmas time. She said, I got a Christmas gift for you. I said, there's a guy who died in Harlingen, and he's leaving you $750,000. And I said, why? I said, why? Is he connected to us? Is he a graduate? I mean, for us, that was a huge amount of money. And he said, uh, no, he never went to school there. He doesn't know anybody. He just uh, saw the commercials on TV, and he thought it would be a good place to leave money for scholarships. Thought you could use it. <laughs> and she said, there is one catch. I said, oh, yeah, no, always a catch. He wants to give the scholarship to C students. <laughs> he said he himself was a C student, and he did very well in life, and the C students never get anything. <laughs> I said, well, what are we going to do? We're going to give this student a C, to give him the, the scholarship for a C. What if they start making A's? We're going to say, hey, you've got to get out there and party. Give us scholarship. So these separate institutions that he created represent a fitting legacy. After all, he said that when he was president, that at the desk where I sit, I have learned one great truth. The answer for all our national problems, all the problems of the world, come to a single word, and that word is education. Education is the answer. Johnson also believed in the education provided by the School of Hard Knocks, as he said his father often told him, you should brush yourself up against the grindstone of life, and that will give you a pause that Harvard and Yale can't give you. So he believed in the tough school as well. LBJ saw the founding of the School of Public Affairs as the greatest chance he had at fostering the continuation of good works for mankind through government. Unlike many today, he believed that your skin didn't determine where you could eat or sleep. When he spoke to a group of students at his School of Public Affairs in Austin about a month before he died, LBJ told them that a life in public affairs, one of helping your fellow man, is the most rewarding of all the work 
that you can undertake in life. He said, quote, the greatest known satisfaction for human beings is knowing, and if you were the only one who knows it, it's there, and that's what's important. Knowing that you've made life more just, more equal, and more opportune for your fellow man. And that's what this school is all about. Right? So just as today is the anniversary of his passing, Tuesday will be the anniversary, 49th, of his burial on the ranch, not so far away. And at that burial, there was Connolly and Billy Graham. Governor Connolly and Billy Graham, they were there at graveside and delivered a few words. And I thought I'd share those with you as a way of concluding. Mr. Graham, in his remarks, said that Mr. Johnson would stand tall in the history books. His 38 years of public service kept him at the center of events that have shaped our destiny. To him, the great society was not some wild, crazy dream. It was a realistic hope. And it seemed to me that those that knew him would agree that the thing nearest his heart was to harness the wealth and the knowledge and the greatness of this nation and help every poor and every oppressed person in the country. Connolly said that Johnson's years of public service added up to, quote, a triumph for the poor a triumph for the oppressed, a triumph for social justice, and a triumph for mankind's never-ending quest for freedom. <clears throat> Mr. Connolly added, along the stream and under these trees he loved, he will now rest. He saw his first light here. He last felt life here. May he now find peace here. Thank you. I understand that we have other elected officials here tonight, and I'd like to recognize them. City Council Member Alyssa Garza, School Board Members Margie Galapando, Miguel Arnaldo, and Clementina Cantu, and also J.P. Maggie Hernandez Morrow, and County Clerk Elaine Cardenas. Um, you know, in your program is a list of the board of directors of the museum. Uh, remember that business about ability that I talked about earlier? Well, here are some more home run hitters. Several could not be here tonight. Uh, Ryan Poe, uh, Tommy Curtis, Claudette White, Carmen Mel, and I think Neil Hatter had to leave early. Uh, but I would like those in attendance to please stand when I call your name. Linda Rodriguez, Ann Burnett, Melissa Millicamp, and our newest board member, Ellie Dietz. The final board member here tonight is special to the museum and that he was one of the founders of the museum and has been a continued presence on the board and has been invaluable to the museum on so many different levels. So we would like to recognize Dr. Ed Mahogany with this little award, which reads, Yep, Linda Baines Johnson Museum of San Marcos presented to Ed Mahokinen in appreciation of your vision as a founder of the museum and your continued years of service as past president and board member. Ed? Silent auction is going to be closing in a little bit, but you have lots of time to eat some of these wonderful desserts that we have. We have a dessert buffet, coffee, and other things along, uh, along those lines. Proceeds from tonight will go in part to up updating the museum auditoriums and also fund events like the fall and spring lecture. Uh, speaking of which, our spring lecture will be February 23rd and feature renowned Texas newsman and author of With the Bark Off, of journalist, mem a journalist memories of LBJ and a life in the news media, Neil Stouts. He should be wonderful. I want to thank our speaker, Dr. W.F. Strong, for being here tonight. I want to thank you all for attending. And please come by and see us at the museum.